roll back to another uh, episode of Think That Kawhi's Human Humane Architecture. And we're still in the claws of the corona COVID virus. And uh, for that, we've been looking into some literally and figuratively cool courtyards as to give us some ease. And if you can get the first slide up, please. Uh, we're broadcasting live again from three locations. I just came back uh, down to Bavaria from the city of Würzburg, which is close to the city of Schweinfurt. And that one we might remember um, because uh, Mies van der Rohe was proposing a museum there in the early 60s that was pretty much... Uh, uh, a remake of what he had designed for uh, Cuba and the Bacardi headquarters, uh, which was in the late 50s. And finally, it all came together uh, and became, he sort of was recycling the, the ideas for the last project, which we've been featuring in the last show, which is the new National Gallery in, in Berlin. And um, I have been uh, suggesting some reading recommendations. This uh, fantastic book here about uh, Mies van der Rohe. And it's a cartoon. It's a manga. It's been written by a Spanish architect who, uh, who illustrated this book. And it's very interesting, if we can get back to the first slide here, that um, at the bottom left is the page that tells us about the rather strange love and hate relationship between who many call blame being the copycat of architecture or a little nice of the chameleon of architecture, who is Philip Johnson. And Philip Johnson, Johnson bought needs to America, and again, but they had kind of a, a stressed relationship with each other. Uh, the magic year was 63 in the last show, and I've been sharing uh, my days in the White Plains of the, of the prairie of the Midwest, where I happened to be uh, coming to teach, and we were sharing, as we used automobiles as me for Fort thought, my 93 Lincoln Town Car, only because of, it's of the same year as Larry Stricker's E-Line. And here at the top left, you can see my 72 Plymouth Fury, which I bought at that time 20 years young or old in 1991 when I came to Nebraska. Nebraska gave me, granted me the University of Nebraska scholarship, and I thank them for that. For the town car later, they gave me an interest-free loan uh, for my family promotion trip. Thank you for that, too. And this building, what we see here, was built in 63. Uh, and that is the Sheldon Gallery by Philip Johnson. And you might say again, if you're doing your sort of historical PI, you might say hmm, maybe he was uh, he was um, sneaking away some ideas. However, again, the Bacardi, in all honesty and fairness, and uh, both the Schaefer Museum and Schweinfurt didn't have courtyards. They only appeared at the very end at the uh, National Gallery. But again, um, um, who knows, and we leave this up for other people, but this one here has, that's why I belong to the Shola Courtyard, with a water feature in the middle, and I used to have my lunch break here. Uh, so uh, that being said, um, we were promising you to go out west, get closer to us in Hawaii, but with this pit stop here in the, in the Midwest, we're going to pick someone up who's going to be our guest, and we know him very well by now from many shows in the past. It's uh, Edward Killingsworth's uh, business partner and friend, Ron Lindgren. Hi, Ron. Hello. How are you? I'm good. Good to have you back on the show. And, of course, we have back in Hawaii, DeSoto, with us again. Hi, DeSoto. Hello, everybody. So, uh, Ron, while I picked you up where you actually originally come from, the Midwest, we drive now out where you have settled, and let's get the next slide up, and you explain us uh, what we see. You know, somewhat pertinent to the discussion we're having today about courtyards is the fact that I think my own home is a rather fine example of, of their residential use. The home wasn't designed by Ed Killingsworth. But the builder and contractor who put it together was very strongly influenced by Ed's early and influential house designs. So when Ed's elder son, Greg, offered it to me for sale, I quickly picked it up. Both the front and the rear elevations of the house 
contained two-story glass walls that provided views and access to open-air garden courtyards. And then I even had a third linear walled court on the side of the house, and it provided some outdoor access between the two major gardens front and back. And that walk on the side was a shady walk through a dense 20-foot-high bamboo grove. Uh, the other thing about the house relating it to courtyards is that uh, easy, breezy living without air conditioning was ensured because the contractor builder provided trellis shading and screened operable glass louvers at every glass wall and window. So all in all, the Lindgren House is a fairly fine and respectable contractor's approximation of what a Killingsworth Southern California mid-century modern house might have might have looked like. But I think it, now it's time to go to the next slide and look at some genuine Killingsworth architecture for more courtyard inspiration. And we have that slide up here of that fantastic house, yep. which is that Excellent. house slide. That's right. We, we're looking at one share some uh, of the principles of of, of courtyard going on. Yes, Ed's, uh, Ed's Forever Family Home uh, utilized courtyards in, in, uh, in almost in excess in some respects. When I, when I was at first a draftsman employee and then a partner, uh, with that experience with Ed, I can show the viewers this sort of extensive and loving use of outdoor courtyards. And they were absolutely essential to the success of his early modern architecture. Now, why would using courtyards make this the case? Well, just consider how multifaceted they were in terms of the humane functions that they that they took uh, as courtyards. We'll look at it. We'll look at this house and discuss it a little more uh, fully. But first, for all of his courtyard houses, they provided outdoor living spaces, which were just as important as interior rooms. That easy breezy living that Martin and DeSoto talk about so much, that indoor outdoor living was facilitated by blurring the distinction between interior and exterior rooms. Because uh, the exterior and the interior were separated only by nearly invisible floor to ceiling window walls and sliding glass doors. And then courtyards were gardens, of course, bringing nature and natural light deep within a building. Also, courtyards are the lungs of architecture, bringing fresh air and natural ventilation deep within a building. In these perilous times of viral pandemic, courtyards are absolutely essential to health, as are lanais and balconies that we talked about uh, previously. And finally, at least in Ed's architecture, courtyards provided memorable entry experiences and a sense of arrival to a very special place place we call home. Now, because of those sort of multifunctional courtyard living aspects to his houses, the quality of life, the, the quality of life experienced in Killingsworth's one- and two-story homes and garden office buildings was among the richest that post-war modern mid-century architecture could provide. So let's look at Ed's house for a moment. Ron, you just said that so beautifully. I, I, I'm in awe. Thank you. Well, I, I'm in awe of having the chance to show people Ed's, Ed's house, which I think is one of his most gracious creations. What you're looking at on the screen is Ed's forever home, built in 1961, on a rather large suburban site of three-quarter acres in Long Beach, California, where he had his architectural practice. He purposely located the house pretty tightly against one property line so as to create the largest adjacent garden possible. So he developed the landscaped area as a courtyard garden by enclosing it with solid 12-foot high wooden walls. They happened to match the height of the home's interior ceilings. So those walls seem to just flow from exterior to interior. And one memorably enters the house precinct through a pair of grand 12-foot tall doors into the outdoor garden not into an interior room. So it's garden first, glance around, then enter into the home proper. And 
Uh, this particular photo shows how a fully glazed corner sitting room is provided broad views across that beautiful private garden. And typical of his residential architecture, there is hardly any visible demarcation between where indoors begins and where outdoor begins. And, and I can also uh, say, too, just as a, as a layperson who's never been there, it's very striking how that lath roof creates this incredibly interesting sun and shade pattern in that interior space. It always, it always Actually, was only, only the red... Yeah, only the vegetation gives you a clue where it's outside and where it's inside. Right. Because these trees are truly out, outside trees, so they are the, the marks of, that give you a clue where where outside is. But other than that, you're absolutely right. This is blurred to the best. Right? Next slide. Yep. The next, the 1962 Frank House, we're looking at some images and photos of it, was case study house number 25, and it's another fine example of courtyard living, uh, a single courtyard in this case, just as Ed had a single large courtyard. This house was hemmed in tightly by neighboring homes on a very narrow site, and so the house and its adjacent two-story entry courtyard were developed between solid sidewalls to ensure visual and oral privacy. And the unforgettable entry experience is through a monumental 17-foot tall door that accesses an outdoor room. This, open, this room is an open-air court. At the same time, surprisingly, it's a sort of museum space because when you're in the court, you can actually see into all of the major rooms, uh, catch a glimpse of their occupants, and uh, find out what they're doing inside the house. Uh, Ed's signature trellised courtyard ceiling provides that lively shadow play within the spare, crisp, and elegant home. Uh, not so obvious in any of the pictures here is the fact that water reflections also from shallow reflecting pools help to enliven the space by putting those reflections on the walls. Yeah, and the, the bottom uh, picture, uh, Ron, I assume it's another Carlos Denise illustration that, that really shows how much of a surprise that courtyard is because you don't have a clue that it's there unless you know Ed and you guys, right? And the other thing we want to point out, and we had a little discussion, or we want to kick off a little discussion with our reference to a previous show about your uh, Kapalua Bay, which unfortunately tragically was torn down. And we said that, you know, while Ed had started out with this one and then had been seeked out by Conrad Hilton and encouraged him to do resort architecture of much bigger, bigger scope and scale, um, uh, the, the, the courtyards were sort of reintroduced uh, until the very end by you and Larry, as we pointed out in the show. But while I was saying the Kahala, their first collaboration didn't have what you he corrected me, right? And how did you correct me with what you tell to an adjacent project? Yeah, it, Ed's use of courtyards at the Kahala, uh, Kahala Apartments, which is next to the Kahala Hilton Hotel, was really a masterful way to have buildings looking very close into each other as far as uh, uh, resident to resident. But uh, even though they, they were only 30-foot wide courtyards, the, the tropical landscaping was so lush and four stories tall that you did have privacy. So here was courtyards used in a very ingenious manner. Yeah. But randomly, that was residential, so actually to the resort architecture, I have to say, and a kudos goes to you and Barry, because you already fully reintroduced it, and not to speak about the Holly Kalani, who does it in the most um, uh, breathtaking way, as we've pointed out in, I think, three or four shows about your masterpiece. Let's move on to the, to another case study house, right? The other one with yes. heavily on the uh, courtyard. The... the uh... John Antenza, uh, who was publisher of Arts and Architecture magazine, selected Ed Killingsworth to design three modern model homes. 
built to advertise what was going to be an 82-house development. This triad, which is now known as Case Study House 23, consisted of very glossy, extroverted pavilion homes, and they were provided with magnificent ocean views from the coastal hillsides of La Jolla back in 1960. Now, these all three homes were garden courtyard homes. In this case, they all uh, utilized three different sorts of courtyards. For example, there were some fully interior court, courtyards surrounded by uh, interior rooms. There were also some outdoor courtyards that were uh, fronted on one side by the home, but on the other side, they were enclosed with very ethereal, translucent glass screens. And finally, there were also some courtyards that were open on only one side, surrounded by buildings elsewhere, so that views could be opened up uh, directly to the ocean views. And as these photos so amply describe, that arrangement of linked glass pavilions and those open-air courtyards really make it difficult to, be, to really figure out which are indoor and which are outdoor spaces. The, the image at the lower left, is also one of the most persuasive depictions I've ever seen of how an enclosed outdoor garden courtyard is just as important a living space as any interior furnished room in a modern home. Again, I think we also have to... The hall, um, oh, I, I was just going to say that this is very much an, uh, a part of the um, climate in which these houses are built. So... In California, you have a lot more time of year when you can use the outdoors, as opposed to Lincoln, Nebraska, for example. That if you come out here where I live, you pretty much can do that 24-7 for all 365 days of the year most of the time. Great point. And I'm here, right? This is our Julie Shulman uh, picture, right? Photographs, right? Um, yes. Most likely. Okay, if you look at move on to the Optal House, if you want. Yeah, if we look at the Optal House, this this home was photographed by the second major famous California architecture photographer Marvin Rand. This is uh, another exquisite courtyard within the 1953 Optal House in Long Beach, California. Now, within the domain created by again tall, solid privacy walls on both sides. A lush two-story garden sanctuary, you can see in one of the photos, was created as part of the unforgettable entry experience at the front of the house. At the rear of the house, uh, there was a single straight run of an open steel stair that takes that elegant twist that you see in, in, at the ground floor on one of the colored photos uh, on the screen. And just beyond the elegant stairway appears a second rear enclosed courtyard and it was accessed by sliding glass doors from the open-plan kitchen and dining room. The American Institute of Architects gave this home a first honor award for design excellence as being the best of architecture done back in 1953. And that is and a very a skinny lot that I can I'm, – I'm looking at that, that plan and yeah. to create that on a very small piece of land is – I think really notable. Well, now what most owners and developers would be opposed to or called by is how much. Look at the percentage of what's dedicated to the to the outdoor living room, which is basically your front yard. Today, would say people would say, "Well, make my house twice as big," and it is. It's, it's just an outdoor living room, right? And for tea, yeah. and that's just you know fronting the house. It's, it's beautiful. Again, for your point. No, not possible in Lincoln, Nebraska, or Würzburg, or Schweinfurt, Germany. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no and I must, I must make a I must make a comment that I was I was born too late because this beautiful home, uh, perfect for a bachelor like myself, but also it turned into a family home. Uh, back then, fully furnished, only cost seventeen thousand dollars. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, wow. Oh, well, those days are gone. <laughs> Let's go on to the, to the next slide, which gets us to a different typology that, that Ed was introducing courtyards as well. 
Yeah, here's here's where uh, we get to connect co- the courtyards and the, the the trope of using a courtyard in terms of uh, humane architecture. You know, the, the the title of your show is Human Humane Architecture, and the competition jury at the sixth Sao Paulo Arts Biennial, which by the way included the master architect Le Corbusier, selected this Cambridge office garden building to be the finest small office space in the entire world uh, during the years of 1960 and 61. Once again, that calculated entry drama, the floor-to-ceiling glazing within a fully exposed structural frame, that stamps this indelibly as a mid-century modern Killingsworth building, elegant, crisp, and beautifully proportioned. Now, again, as in some of the houses we've just seen, there are solid walls provided at the side property lines to provide complete office privacy, while enclosing two-story linear side courtyards. Now, it provided his very own landscape plans for all of his small houses and garden office buildings. In other words, there were one or two sheets in the construction drawings that were drawn personally by Ed as landscape plans. Uh, in some of the Photos there, you can see that tightly spaced wood two by three trellis members were draped overhead uh, a procession of some flying beings. And they created those sort of striated open ceilings over the gardens. Now, the humanity and, comes and in. Ron, do I remember correctly that the image at the top right was one of S drawing? Do you recall that? That perspective, that entrance perspective? Yes, that's correct. And, uh, he, he drew beautifully, but he had one Achilles heel. He couldn't draw people for squat. <laughs> <laughs> so one way to determine if you see a drawing that might be by Ed is check and see if the people have pinheads. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. They just can be unpopulated, beautiful, inter- beautiful buildings. I think it's really good that you mentioned that Ed was was a stickler for the um, planting plans because in these enclosed little courtyards, it's actually very, very important what you plant. And you can't put in plants that are going to get too big. You can't put in a giant tree, but you also want to make sure that the proportions are right overall. So obviously, and I'm glad to hear this from you directly, that Ed was aware of that and tried to specify things that would fit in the space that would be part of that architectural view. He had he had so much landscape know-how, but he also was great at being able to plant things that were relatively easy to maintain, so yeah. it wasn't such a huge out-of-pocket expense. Yeah. But at the same time, I've worked with landscape architects who perhaps didn't know Hawaii well, and they would be planting things that didn't grow well there. Yeah. Uh, but Ed, Ed had the skill of knowing what would grow, and what would grow in uh, not an inexpensive manner necessarily. Gardens aren't cheap, but n- not to uh, break the bank. Yeah, absolutely. What, what the, I was going to say. Share the, let's share the other uh, office. And this is also very timely, right? Because um, where do we work these days? Home office, quarantine, or in offices like that? And you have been foreseeing what's coming, almost visionary. So let's share the other office typology iteration of courtyard. Yeah. Yes. The, uh, the, other, uh, the other office is, again, uh, exemplary of Ed's concern about uh, providing a humane space to work uh, and working for lawyers, and this was a lawyer's office, sometimes involves long, long hours, 16 hours a day. Uh, and I must preface my comments here by saying that Ed was handed yet another AIA First Honor Award for Design Excellence for what was the very first client workspace that he created in his Killingsworth independent practice. So right out of, you know, right out of the, uh, with his very first work, he wins the highest award that the AIA can give for an independent building. Now, the, in, the interior structure of the 1958 Clock Westman Clock Law Office's reception lobby was extended outdoors to uh, enclose an entry walkway uh, in open, open-air open garden pavilions, which also delicately enclosed some magnificent olive trees, 
the site plan that you see on the screen shows how it desired to place all offices, whether they were private or communal uh, offices, put them directly adjacent to what were shallow, linear outdoor walled courtyard gardens. And the fully glazed walls provided a view of lush plantings and a flood of natural light to reach every employee's desk. Not only that, but you also got a glimpse of the sun, a glimpse of the open sky, uh, and you had a feeling uh, of time passing, you know, what time, how many hours you had been working there. In fact, even clerks confined to that most te tedious research in the law library worked next to a tiny but bright amenity of an open-air atrium garden courtyard. It only measured three feet by three feet deep by 12 feet wide, but it again provided the fresh air and the humane relief of a view of nature beneath the glimpse of oceans of open sky. Yeah, that is just. And I'm uh, sure our founding uncle Jay Fidel, uh, having been a lawyer in his previous life, truly appreciates that contribution to his profession. <laughs> No, it's so it's so important to have that to have that connection to be able to look up from your page when you're so involved in something and just look at some plants and see the wind blowing and maybe even see some birds and insects because it takes you away from the drudgery of what could be otherwise just draining your soul. Yeah, and you just sort of make the observation that this looks like a contemporary picture and that maybe yeah. Ron share with us in which condition all these houses are then, all these projects are that you shared with us, Brian. Yeah, uh, one of the happy things I can say is that everything we've seen and will see uh, uh, are still being used. Uh, the stewardship over the years has been gratifyingly, uh, has been very gratifying. They look as new as the day they were opened, and they're all used as homes and working offices uh, today. That's a very good yeah. thing to hear. So let's, uh, we're running out of time, but let's stop by back home in Hawaii for a little bit with the next slide. What we're showing here is, is that uh, my design partner and friend, Larry Stricker, had described the five-home Manolani Grove development on the Big Island of Hawaii. And they, too, have courtyard aspects. The entry court that you see in the upper left led to the front door of an, of an entrance pavilion. And when you stepped in and uh, we're at the entry, if you look forward, there was a handsome view uh, into a pool courtyard, uh, which had a jacuzzi and a linear swimming pool. And it also opened onto views of the ancient Hawaiian fish ponds and the open ocean beyond. beyond. So courtyards in residential Hawaii. This is why that would have been, which Mary rightly so calls a Hawaii case study house, yeah. uh, which gets the closest to the original idea, however, many decades later. And let's go to the final slide for today and uh, tell us what we see, uh, Ron. Well, uh, there's a beautiful little, uh, really pure example of a, a modern glass post and bee pavilion uh, called the Robertson House. Uh, it was actually designed by its partner, Was Smith. It was only 12 foot wide by 48 foot long, uh, which is smaller, in fact, than, than my rear courtyard in my own home. But it had incredible broad ocean views from a chillside site, almost 800 feet above the city of Laguna Beach, California. Uh, and below that uh, is one of Ed's favorite and uh, unhappiest projects in the sense that it didn't, well, it wasn't realized. You, you see a plan there. He developed, it, it developed a low cost plan for what would have been ranks of linked one story garden courtyard houses meant to replace South American slums. Now the client was an inventor uh, and uh, he also admired Ed's architecture. This inventor had come up with a lightweight concrete building system for home construction back in 1952. Mass produced wall, floor, and ceiling elements were made of pre stressed lightweight concrete slabs, which in turn were cast around even lighter styrene foam panels. And, uh, 
it's hard to believe, really, but these slim roof panels could span 20 feet without requiring beams. And because of their lightness, the lightness of these elements that could make uh, a home, uh, workers, construction workers, could carry and lift all of the panels into place without having to use any heavy equipment. Uh, and unfortunately, the client's laudable aims to provide uh, inexpensive, handsome, modern courtyard housing to uh, South Americans, plus the creation of his own home as a test case for the building system, they just weren't realized. And I've never known why. And even when I asked Ed why, he, he deigned not to tell me. And, and again, how timely is that? Because we've been looking out for not full courtyard for the rich, uh, yes. but for the many one, the many ones at the other end, um, at the lowest end of the food chain, especially through the economic and and viral crisis we're facing. So this is so timely. This is to be digged out. Uh, let's build it. Uh, and also, you will see further down uh, this volume here of courtyards in homage to that by Tropic David Rockwood. And so, until then, uh, Ron, I think uh, since you uh, can exper have experience firsthand, you just had a terrible heat wave, and you survived it, uh, you know, through and in your house and with your house. I think we want to know more about it. So, uh, hopefully, we can twist your arm and and walk us through your house more in detail next week. Can we do that? Yes. I look, I look forward to that. Me too. Awesome. Let's do that. Okay, until then, stay literally and figuratively cool to Easy Breezy and Easy Breezy Courtyard. Thank you, guys. Bye. See you next week. Bye now.